Today we have Dr. Laura Panette. Uh, she is an occupational ergonomist and an epidemiologist. She is a professor and acting chair of biomedical engineering at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and co-director of the Center for the Promotion of Health in the New England Workplace, one of the first National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health Centers for Excellence in Total Worker Health. She was also a co-founder of the university's Department of Work Environment in 1987. She has specific research expertise in socioeconomic disparities, gender differences in health and healthcare workers. Her current focus is on work-related musculoskeletal disorders and evaluation of total worker health, the integration of worksite health protection with other measures to increase worker well-being. I also have with me the producer of our show, uh, Diti Bhatt. My name is Vivek Narayan. Dr. Panet, welcome to the episode. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Panet, um, we usually uh, start off with asking our guests how they got into um, the field that they're in. What is their sort of personal interest? Uh, would you mind walking us through how you got into uh this particular area and and what are perhaps some of the uh, maybe a, a little bit of a personal story as to what really got you uh, interested in this space because I know in our previous conversation you had sort of brought up some of the influences uh, as you were uh, you know uh, starting your professional journey. It's so interesting because I find that a relatively small proportion of people in the field of occupational health and safety started out with this as a career goal. Most of us don't even know that it exists as a field uh, and uh, un until we kind of happen on it by chance, which I feel very lucky to have done because I, I truly feel that I found my calling. But I guess I would say as a, as a high school student, so I sort of came of age during the environmental movement of the 1970s. I went to Earth Day celebrations. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, I had my consciousness raised about the impact of the environment generally on our health, but no one was really connecting that up with the experience of people inside the factories. It was more about air pollution and water pollution that impacts gen the general public. Mm -hmm. And I had something of an orientation towards science. I loved math, um, but I didn't want to be a bench scientist. I wanted to do science in some way that engaged with the social issues that I cared about. Uh, I, I wasn't really sure what that was at first. I, I explored women's health issues. I liked the way a lot of... Um, activity, again, during that time period was about uh, empowering women with good information to make good decision to making about their health. But I couldn't, I'm using now my language about it that I didn't have at the time, but I couldn't exactly find an effective model of change in the women's health space, meaning if we do this, then that will follow and here's why. Like there wasn't, it, it was sort of diffuse and it wasn't really clear how you would know if you made a difference. What would it look like if things got better? You could be very utopian about that, but what would it look like kind of year by year if things were improving and how would you get there? Wasn't I, I could never really get a handle on it. So, so that felt in a way not very satisfying. And occupational health and safety, I was introduced to by chance through a friend of a friend basically, but it caught my interest because the issues are addressed within a defined structure. There, there's a workplace or there's an industry. So whether it's a large or a small workplace, whether it's public sector or private, whether it's manufacturing or mining or, or service delivery, there's, a, there's an organization, there's a decision-making process. And to some extent, the the decision-making criteria or priorities are defined by somebody. You, I mean, you might agree or disagree, but they're they're defined. And so you know who you, whom you're trying to convince, and you can think about what kind of information might be persuasive to move things in the right direction. And you can see mm -hmm. more easily the, the dynamics that are in play within the organization. And so right. that felt to me like something that I could 
operationalized. Like I could, I could get, I could have a plan and see mm-hmm. if it was working or not. And that really right. appealed to me. Again, I guess this is sort of the latent, you know, scientist. Um, and again, I, I had an early love of mathematics. So epidemiology as a way to quantify exposure and quantify risk that that appealed to the, the numbers geek in me. Um, whereas the the social context appeared appealed to me uh, it, as a as a you know a civil rights or a social justice advocate that I that I hope to be. So that that's how I that's how I got to the field in general, and, and then specifically to ergonomics. Um, uh, the when I went to graduate school, actually, because I was interested in women's health, I thought I would be studying reproductive hazards. And then the program director stopped me in the hall one day and invited me to come to a meeting about carpal tunnel syndrome. I didn't have the faintest idea what that was. Nobody was talking about it. I really, I had to go look it up and we didn't, we didn't have Google then either. I had to go look right. it up and find out what it was, but he invited me to a meeting about carpal tunnel syndrome at the offices of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in New York. And okay. I was so flattered that he asked me to go that of course I said, yes. I mean, I really didn't have the faintest idea what this was about, but I was just, I was so thrilled to be asked <laughs> that I went. And that, you know, the short version of that story is it led to a doctoral thesis on ergonomic issues in garment work, in, in stitching ladies clothing. Um, and so I've been in that space of ergonomics and musculoskeletal disorders ever since. That's fascinating. Um, I, will, I, I think, and everyone has a unique story, and, but just to hear like someone's specific unique story, I, I always find it sort of fascinating. It's like a, um, you know, it's like one of those sort of meandering stories that may not necessarily make sense while you're uh, on that journey. But once you're sort of at a particular place and you're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Everything, uh, you know, kind of fit into place. So uh, it's it's wonderful to hear this, uh, to, to hear your story. Um, you touched upon a couple of uh, a couple of topics that I think uh, uh, would be interesting for our listeners, right? So one was on uh, uh, women's health, uh, gender equity, sort of that box of of thought. Um, if you could, based on your experience, uh, perhaps put that into context for our listeners, right? So what I you know, you mentioned that um, a factory in New York, garment workers, there's a particular, uh, you know, what used to be called an RSI at some point in time. Now it's work-related musculoskeletal disorders uh, specific to uh, women. Uh, and there's a reason why uh, it was it was because women were in that factory. I'm assuming if it was men in that factory, something similar would have happened to men. But it's just more than, you know, the individual agenda. There's a whole sort of milieu as to why, uh, you know, women versus men have certain issues. Uh, perhaps paint a picture for us uh, with that lens that you have, you know, about gender equity and sort of empowerment and the women's movement that you sort of were influenced by as you were, uh, uh, you know, getting into your career. You just set it up perfectly. I mean, again, women's health, I think people, you know, would hear that phrase and would think primarily about things like child raising or um, menstruation, you know, things we put into the sort of OBGYN category. Um, and, And then by looking at the garment industry, I mean, here was this setting where probably 85 or 90% of the workers were female. The men were in the quote unquote more skilled jobs and were higher paid, even within this industry that was so female dominated. And they, I'm not saying they didn't also have ergonomic problems, but the women's work was seen as less skilled, which I actually didn't think was justified when I did the detailed job analyses and when I watched them work and when I talked to them about, when I asked them about what they were doing and why, 
uh, I came to understand that there was a very high level of skill that was basically taken for granted in some mm-hmm. ways, maybe by themselves, too, because making clothing is something also that women might do at home. A lot of these women had been immigrants and they you know, had probably learned to use a sewing machine when they were girls like I did. And so they maybe didn't think of it as a skill that should be valued in the workplace, but certainly other people weren't, weren't treating it as, uh, as, as you might hope skilled work would be seen. So it gave me, it gave me a new understanding of the broad social factors that determine not only um, traditional women's rights issues like inequalities in pay or prestige, but also directly health status, that the, the mm-hmm. con- where the women were concentrated within the work process determined what their ergonomic exposures were and what their health outcomes were. So that was really eye-opening for me. I think we've seen another version of this maybe in the healthcare sector. Um, women in healthcare jobs for decades have been understood by occupational health people. Um, they're working long hours and heavy physical labor. It's underappreciated. Um, there's a way often in which nurses are categorized as uh, providing TLC to patients rather than being seen as highly skilled professionals. So it's a little bit the same thing that their skills are are devalued because they fit within a traditional female role. Mm-hmm. Um, there are lots of psychological stressors. There's a, there's a lot of violence in the United States, at least. It was just on the newspaper today, the, the, yeah. the, the magnitude of violent attacks in healthcare institutions. So, but this, none of this is new, but I think since the global COVID pandemic, there's more public awareness of the fact that healthcare workers leave their jobs in part because they the working conditions are challenging and they don't feel adequately compensated or respected for the work they do. And again, that's not new, but the general public, I think, is more aware of that than they used to be, which is a good thing. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think, and perhaps the issue may have quietened down uh, uh, in the last couple of months or the last six months or so, but provider burnout uh, is a is a is a serious concern. It has been, um, but I think to your point, uh, COVID really brought that issue out uh, in an acute manner uh, for everyone, uh, the general public. Um, and being in being within healthcare, you sort of be like, finally people actually you know you recognize how difficult it can be, but we had spoken in our previous conversation, you had mentioned something about um, the uh, emotional burden uh, between the genders, right? So when you're, one is looking after someone, there's a particular role that is ascribed and the emotional sort of burden of that role as a caregiver, um, sometimes in many situations, at least in India, uh, this is very common, but in other uh, uh societies as well, that that burden falls on women. And there's an expectation that they are going to be the primary caregivers, but often uh, uh, their contribution, I don't want to say is overlooked, but there's a, almost a poor understanding of what we're asking, um, you know, our mothers and our sisters to do. Uh, would you... Do, I know that some of your research has sort of gone into that, and I don't want to go too deeply into it because we're trying to focus on, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, workshop that you're conducting for Primus. But I think that's an interesting sort of uh, segue into that. Would you be able to sort of describe to our audience uh, some of your uh, work in that uh, in that field? Sure. I, I think the concept that you're referring to. Uh, we have kind of a formal label for it, which is uh, emotional labor, which yeah. is more than just providing emotional services to people, if you like. It's actually about having to mask your own emotional experience in order to take care of other people. So it, it means that you um, pretend that something is okay, even when something someone is screaming at you because 
let's say you're a nurse taking care of a sick patient or, or a distressed person. So you understand that they're screaming because they can't help it because they are in pain or whatever. And so you pretend that you aren't really upset inside for being screamed at or being threatened and you continue to take care of them. And this is absolutely built into healthcare work of necessity because healthcare workers are providing for people in distress a large part of the time and they know it. And to some extent, the training of nurses and other healthcare workers, maybe physicians as well now, is uh, takes into addresses, let's see, how do I want to say that? To some extent, the training of healthcare workers, I think now tries to provide for some uh, support and some um, self-protection against the impact mm -hmm. of those situations. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact. It doesn't yeah. mean that it isn't really difficult to handle. And if you're handling it day after day, it, has, it wears you down. And if you feel like the institution doesn't back you up, for example, I've heard stories from uh, nursing aides in nursing homes that if a patient becomes violent, the aide is automatically blamed and isn't given the opportunity to tell their side of the story, right? So so if, if the institution doesn't back you up, if there isn't a safe space for you to debrief afterwards, if you aren't getting emotional support from other people, the toll it takes on you is going to be a lot greater. It's interesting that it it this experience of masking your own feelings, mm -hmm. it doesn't only happen in jobs that look like uh, taking care of other people jobs. So, so you can sort of easily picture healthcare, um, teaching, right? Child care jobs. You can easily picture your focus is on taking care of the other person. But actually, there are lots of other service occupations where this happens as well. For example, in in airports and airlines, the gate, the people at the gates and the people at the ticket counters and the flight attendants. I mean, we've all read stories about travelers losing control of adult behavior and, and just really going off on yeah. people in extraordinary yeah. ways. And that's that's another situation where the staff, they have to pretend that it isn't impacting them on the inside in order to meet the demands of the job. And okay, you know, once in a while, and if everybody else is around, around you is upset and gives you support and, you know, helps you debrief afterwards, you know, it might be traumatic in the moment, but you're probably going to get through it. But when it becomes a really endemic situation, when, when passengers around the world are behaving badly day after mm -hmm. day, the total impact can be enormous. And we actually collaborated with a colleague in South Korea looking at economy-wide, in the entire South Korean economy, there were all sorts of jobs where you might not have thought that this kind of emotional masking was required, and that throughout the entire economy, it had a strong association with people becoming not only burned out, but anxious and depressed and, and really not able to function in their work anymore. So I think it's really underappreciated for the impact that it's having on our economy. And people and people leaving the jobs, and and needing healthcare services. There's a uh, as as you were describing this this ability or not ability but the necessity to mask one's emotion. Um, I was reminded of some research that I uh, came across where um, our perception of emotion and the expression of emotion on our face happens so quickly that the theory or the hypothesis is that our ability to express emotion actually allows us to perceive emotion in the first place. And so, um, and given that it's regulated, if I remember correctly, it's regulated through the prefrontal cortex. And so, um, you know, if we're exposed to emotional stimuli, we're not able to express ourselves. What we're really doing is we're telling our brain um, we're almost like desensitizing ourselves. So it's it's not surprising to me um, that a prolonged exposure to this kind of uh, environment actually will lead to expression, uh, depression, right? Excuse That's me. interesting. So, so it's like a cognitive dissonance. You're, you're yeah, yeah, exactly. You're having to pretend to yourself that nothing's happening when in fact yeah. it's a very yeah. stressful situation. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm going to make a note to explore this uh, after this particular <laughs> conversation. Uh, I've, uh, I find this kind of stuff uh, uh, particularly interesting. Um, Feel free to send me the article. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the professor's name was uh, Martin Seligman or some someone, Dr. Seligman. Okay. I, um, That's a familiar yeah, name, I'll, actually. Yeah. I'll, okay. I'll send that across to you. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm writing it down. <laughs> Um, something that your uh, research has focused on, and it's a, I think it's a good segue, which is we know that there are certain situations in a workplace um, that now have uh, almost like an adverse impact on our workers, right? Now, whether it's uh, a, a sort of a physical uh, stressor or whether it's an emotional stressor, we have workplace stressors that are leading to adverse outcomes for our workers. Um, and there is a recognition that something needs to be done. Um, I think your uh, research sort of uh, focuses on uh, making sure that there's active participation between, quote unquote, the workers and the managers to come up with uh, a, a better solution for uh, not only workers, but for the institute or for the for the employers. Uh, could you perhaps tell us uh, a bit about that, uh, perhaps even uh, uh, touch upon a particular case study that is coming to mind? Uh, I think that might be a, a good way of perhaps setting up uh, uh, the conversation on the workshop as well. Sure. Uh, so so the, the idea of participatory ergonomics also isn't new. Um, it's something that uh, I admired but wasn't so involved in until I uh, became co-director of one of the Total Worker Health Centers, as you mentioned earlier, because that, that mission of Total Worker Health is to combine protecting people from hazards in the workplace with supporting them to be healthier in other ways. So it's trying to take a more comprehensive and integrated approach to supporting the health and well-being of the workforce generally. And, and this means also accounting for the, um, the impacts of socioeconomic disparities on low-wage workers. So if you're in a, a low-wage, low-prestige job, you probably have more physical effort involved and it may be psychologically more stressful and you may live in a neighborhood where it isn't safe to be out on the street to go running or um, what's what we call a food desert in the United States where mm -hmm. there aren't grocery stores where you can buy fresh produce and you know there's a lot of junk food being sold around you um, so it's that kind of mix of you know, and and because you're low wage you can't afford to live somewhere else so exactly. the workplace is still implicated in there kind of indirectly. And so that's a very challenging set of problems to think about, right? It's it, exactly because it's all encompassing. Um, how do you pick that apart and where do you start and, and what's realistic to do? And not all of it can be fixed by individual employers, of course. Some of it requires social policy and, and, and larger scale changes. But if you're working with individual employers and, and companies and, and, and groups of workers, you can drill down a little bit to understand how these things play out and how they actually impact individual people. Workers know their own situations, both at work and, and outside of work, and we need to hear from them about how things happen because, I, I, well, I've heard many stories from workers of things that I would not have imagined by just looking at their jobs. Um, for example, um, within our research center, we've done a lot of work with correction officers and mm -hmm. they, they uh, tend to get overweight as they accrue seniority on the job, partly because they're often at risk of having to work two or three shifts at a time, and there isn't mm -hmm. really much food available within the prison. So they'll bring in enormous coolers with enough food for 24 hours in case they need it, and then they'll sit and eat it all because there they are. And mm 
Um, they, in theory, could get exercise in the gym, in the in the prison facility, because it's open for prisoners at sometimes and for officers at other hours. But for security reasons, for, for valid security reasons, the prison mm-hmm. always has to maintain a certain level of staffing. So if you're at the end of your shift and you're about to go home and someone who's supposed to come in to replace you doesn't show up or calls in and says they're not coming, and you're still on the grounds, you legally cannot refuse to work the next shift. So you right. can imagine how many corrections officers head to the gym when they get off work, right? Zero, because then you're yeah. still on the grounds and you can't turn down yeah. the next shift. So they're like in their pickup trucks and out of the parking lot within 30 seconds, like absolutely as fast as they can go. So so, and this isn't a, a health policy, this is a security policy, but it has this impact on the, the whole situation, the fact that they're working two or three shifts, the fact that they're eating too much, the fact that they don't get exercise because they can't afford to stay, uh, you know, on the on the grounds and, and, and be at risk of working yet another shift. It exists for completely different reasons, but the health impacts are enormous. And I wouldn't yeah. have imagined any of this, never having yeah. worked in in that setting. I wouldn't have imagined any of this. It was by having corrections officers sit and talk to us about what the obstacles were to being healthy that we learned all of this. Um, so, so many examples, but but that's, I think, a really vivid one. Um, even just in terms of traditional safety, there might be machine guarding on a machine, but if your supervisor is constantly nagging you about working faster, you may have an incentive to bypass the guarding or lift something manually instead of using a hoist or a crane that takes a little bit mm-hmm. longer because you don't want your supervisor writing you all the time and you're worried about your job security and you know you might like to get a promotion. And so so these kinds of incentives that work against staying safe and and maintaining health are they're um, unfortunately really widespread and they're quite varied they depend a lot on the circumstances of the particular workplace and if we don't know about these things we might think that just based on the science here here's the ergonomic program i'm going to put into place and we might not Mm -hmm. recognize why is it going to fail we might not appreciate that there are factors that are going to interfere. People aren't going to follow what we put into place. It's not going to have the benefits that we hope for. So it's really, we, we find that it's really, really valuable to spend time listening to people and understanding what the scope of the issue is from their point of view and also what their priorities are. If, right. if people are are worried about breathing in dust in the air and you're nagging them about cigarette smoking, they may feel that the you know the employer isn't taking care of business as they ought to, and so really has no business saying anything to them about what they do on their personal right, time. Right. Yeah. So it, you know it's about it's about worker motivation. It's about understanding what their circumstances are. It's understanding what are the things that get in their way in order to be healthy. And um, I, I just I just think that, you know, the more I've done this, the more I've appreciated why employers have this experience of they put a program into effect and it works for a little while and then it stops working. And I think often that's because they didn't really dig into what are the root causes, what are the what are the right. underlying issues that keep problems yeah. in place. I, I think uh, I think the word that you use, uh, root cause, I think is important here because what what you're describing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is really you know there's a system, there's system effects, um, and then you know not only I think you know when you're it's almost like we're using deep ethnography or some of those ethnographic tools to really understand what the root cause is and. To your point, the root cause could be completely unrelated to what we think the system actually is trying to tell us, right? So um, uh, the fact that one has to address the root cause sounds, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like a, it's a it's a breakthrough. Uh, uh, it kind of almost makes intuitive sense. But I think what you're describing is that very often uh, we don't address what the root cause is, and then any kind of implementation that we have or a solution is 
is fundamentally doomed to fail because we haven't addressed the root cause. So that makes complete sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I like the way you framed that. Some of my engineering colleagues say that I do social science, which is not really my self image, but there is a, there is a, we definitely borrow methods from the social sciences. I mean, the qualitative research to, to elucidate, you know, to understand the worker's experience, we do borrow from, from those methods. And at the same time, we take a kind of a systems analysis approach that's more like what an engineer does. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's fun to have that range of, of methods all in play at the same time. It, it's something that we had, uh, uh, so f- selfishly from a product perspective, um, it's something that we, you know, we, uh, uh, deploy or employ, uh, intentionally, which is, you know, how do we really get into, um, the end user, their experiences? How do we develop that empathy? Um, but also I think, so I've been exposed to the Stanford biodesign program, but similar, Programs exist everywhere uh, as well, but the idea of you know shadowing, having these deep conversations, and really just it is it is a method of ethnography, right? So yeah, it I think it's a very effective way of really truly sort of creating that empathy and understanding the needs and the, the requirements and those sorts. Of things. Yeah, what I would what I would add on is the next step is the idea of of looking for patterns across all these cases. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the workshop that we're going to be doing at Premus, Mm -hmm. one of the parts of the presentation will be a report, will be a description uh, of uh, a big um, review of Mm -hmm. experiences of participatory ergonomics in a lot of different kinds of workplaces where we we actually we started with the system analysis. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, we started with the system analysis of um, what are the contextual factors that might affect success of a program. So okay. um, these could be things like whether all the workers are participating or they elect a few representatives to design the program. Uh, it could be uh, something to do with the kinds of resources that the enterprise can make available. If it's a large company, they may have skilled people who, who have technical health and safety knowledge. They may be able to invest more in uh, protective equipment, whereas a small company isn't going to have those resources. So we, we, we drew a diagram with all of these contextual factors that might affect the success of a participatory ergonomics program. And then we, mm-hmm. we took a large number of case studies and basically grouped them according to which of these factors played an important role in, in right. the different clusters. And uh, so, so we were, I think, able to generate some generalizable. So going beyond the individual cases, you know, this interesting thing happened here and that interesting thing happened here. How does someone else use that in their project? Mm-hmm. How does someone else use that right. in their workplace? So what we tried to do was to generate a set of, of principles for when projects succeeded in actually getting workers involved in a genuine way. Um, so that's part of what people can uh, can expect to hear about if they come to our workshop is, is talking about these kinds of patterns of factors and what are the preconditions that will help a program right. be successful. So sort of like a roadmap or almost like a playbook, which is, um, you know, hey, if, if, if you want to implement a program, this is how you go about doing it. And oh, by the way, these are the signposts that you see along the way, which are telling you whether you're on the right path or not. Is, is that a fair well, way of describing? Well, um, the, the, the review of the cases isn't going to be so much one way to do it because these cases, we, again, we had dozens of cases and they used many different approaches. Um, but we will be sharing a, a, a playbook. We will be sharing a roadmap um, because my research group, uh, the Center for the Promotion of Health in the New England Workplace, we have a program called the Healthy Workplace Participatory Program. All the materials are free on our website. Anybody could go there right now and see the training videos and the worksheets and and the facilitator guides and all of that. But we will actually 
um, use about half the day to have people work through some of the initial steps in this process. So they get a little bit of a, you know, imagined hands-on experience. And okay. it, it does start with doing some root cause analysis, assessing the readiness of the institution to actually mm -hmm. engage workers in the program. Uh, so it, it is a pretty detailed roadmap. Uh, different institutions have adapted it in different ways, and we ourselves are always sort of creating variations to adapt to different settings because it, this is never one size fits all. But we find that overall our, our, um, our materials and our, uh, our game plan, it, it, mm -hmm. if you kind of keep your eyes fixed on what are the big principles, it, it has been pretty successful in a lot of different settings. And that's what we're um, going to be. Um, coaching people on doing so hopefully that they can take back to their own institutions and try that out. So, so we, yes, yeah, so we will be offering that kind of a roadmap. And at the same time, we're going to be talking about what are the factors in your workplace or in your industry that um, you can look to for support in setting up a participatory ergonomics program and what are the factors that might be problematic and you might want to invest a little time there first to strengthen those before you move forward. One example of that is communication within an organization. We okay. find that yeah. very often when we do this organizational readiness assessment, there isn't very good vertical communication within the, the company or the agency between the the, the rank and file workers, the hourly workers, the, the wage labor, and the people at the top. Right. The people at the top might send announcements down, but they don't necessarily unpack their thinking. They don't necessarily yeah. provide a rationale, and they often don't really hear. So this this goes back to the, the focus group thing, right? They also don't sit and listen to their own workers describe their experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So there's information that doesn't get up to the top and there are right. and there's a lot of information that also doesn't come back down because it's just put out in a in a sometimes kind of authoritarian or, or at least very truncated way, very summarized. You know, here's what's going to happen, but not necessarily why. And that that those communication issues are going to interfere a lot with a successful participatory program because inherently worker participation means the workers are going to be out looking for information and they're exactly. going to express their opinions to management. And so if, if nobody is prepared for this communication to happen in either direction, it's, it's not going to go very smoothly or very efficiently. Right. Um, this, if you if you could describe uh, to the uh, to our listeners some of the advantages of actually creating a participatory program versus say a non-participatory one, right? I mean, you've kind of alluded to the fact that it's probably going to fail, but um, I think there's. Would you be able to give us some perhaps tangible uh, outcomes, or perhaps you know the probability of success? It, I'm assuming is going to be higher, right? Um, I don't know that we can really conclude that yet from the literature. Okay. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so first of all, some kinds of ergonomics or safety programs will succeed, I think, even if there's not a lot of worker involvement, if they rely heavily on things like improving the machinery, improving the equipment, okay. providing uh, safe lifting devices. I know I gave you an example before that somebody might work around and that can happen. But but um, if, if it's really about investing in better hardware and software, um, it might be very effective in reducing back injuries or, or whatever other problem is in place, even if there's not a lot of worker involvement in creating the program. In fact, we, uh, our, our research center, well, one of our first projects was evaluating a, uh, a safe resident handling program in a big chain of nursing homes. And 
the nursing aides weren't given any say at all in the design of the program. So from that point of mm -hmm. view, it wasn't at all a participatory ergonomics activity. Although the program was designed by nurses who mm -hmm. had experienced these problems and knew about a lot of the things that needed to be built in to make the program successful. So it wasn't enough to buy the resident lifting equipment. They, they had details about, uh, and, and, and of course you have to train the staff in how to use them, but they had details about how many slings you had to have and when the batteries were going to be recharged on these devices. And they, I mean, they went into great detail in, in the space set up to make sure that the lifts weren't stuck in the back of the linen closet where you couldn't get them where you need. So they knew all the things that could go wrong and they had a lot of specifications to try to prevent those things from happening. And we mm -hmm. actually found that they did a phenom this program did a phenomenal job of reducing back injuries and workers' compensation claims, including repeat injuries and also in reducing turnover. So there's an example of a non-participatory program that was very successful. Again, I think because there was worker experience built into the design, even, right. you know, and also because it relied very heavily on the company spending a lot of money to buy equipment, which paid off for them. Their return on investment right. was very quick because they were having such high costs from workers' compensation claims and from turnover, staff turnover. And both of those went down really quite dramatically after the program was implemented. So, yeah, so, I, so I'd so i be reluctant to say, you know, a, a non-participatory ergonomics program is always going to fail. It, it really is, again, you know, it, it could work well in some settings. I do think also we have... Um, and I'm going to be like ultra nerdy scientist. We we don't have as good data as we'd like about yeah. the effectiveness of participatory ergonomics programs because you really can't use a like a classic um, randomized clinical trial kind right. of design to evaluate them. I mean, you can't blind people to whether they're in a participatory know, program yeah. or not, you know, yeah. and, and the, and the change is at the level of the whole organization, not at the level of one person. So it's not like everybody's getting blue pills and they don't know if they have an active ingredient or not. No, I mean, the whole organization is transforming how it approaches health and safety of the workforce. So there's, you know, we, we've tried to do studies where we've had other institutions serve as control groups and that can work, but it's really difficult. I mean, no two organizations are the same. It, you know, you'd, you'd have to have really billions of dollars to be able to randomize hundreds of organizations to participatory right, right. or non-participatory, right? So, so the, I, you know, I think it's a fair criticism that the quality of the evidence about the effectiveness um, is is not where we would like it to be or where we might imagine it to be. I do think the sustainability of a program is going to be mm -hmm. higher when there's worker involvement. So if you can find benefits in it and it's worth continuing then then I would feel comfortable making the argument that it, it has a much higher chance of being incorporated into the standard operating procedures and having people continue to comply with whatever is needed to make the program keep working. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, for the average listener of the show, um, uh, what... Uh, what type of industries or what type of workplaces, you know, so now I'm deciding, should I be, should I, should I be engaging in this workshop or should I explore what this participatory uh, uh, worker improvement program, what is, what does this mean? So uh, who, who would it be useful for, um, you know, if, if I'm, uh, what type of industries, what type of workplaces would be interested in something like this? I haven't yet found a setting where I don't where I think this is irrelevant. 
I, I, okay. I, I'll put myself out on a limb and I think I th and say that I think any kind of workplace because ergonomic hazards are so widespread in offices mm -hmm. and service work in manufacturing. Um, you really, I don't know where you don't in transportation. I mean, where do you not find ergonomics problems for starters? And and the the um, the fixes are not always as simple as buying a lot of handling equipment. So so the the kind of the trade offs between different strategies of how to reduce those hazards. Um, that's a that's a set of decisions that is going to benefit from having worker input so that their lived experience is reflected in in what it is that they are being asked to do and and how they're going to cooperate or participate or, or comply um, but we've we've used it well I've already give you some examples so we've we've used it ourselves in healthcare we've used it in corrections we're use we we have now a project going on in uh, elementary schools elementary and middle schools with teachers um we've uh we've used it in office settings mm -hmm. uh we have had other colleagues use our method in uh, grocery stores so public sector private sector large and small companies yeah that that's quite the that's quite the range of um uh settings um so I think that's uh, super fascinating. Um, switching gears a little bit, and you mentioned, uh, you alluded to the fact that perhaps we don't have the, you know, the data, uh, but it would be nice to have that data, but perhaps capturing that data or recording it is going to be tough. Um, but where do you see, like if you had a magic hat or, or you know, if you could sort of dictate what would happen uh, in the next maybe five years, where do you, where do you see um, you know, colleagues uh, such as yourself, yourself and your colleagues, what is it that they would like to happen or wish could happen in the next five years? What, what does the future look like um, <laughs> for your uh, particular oh, area of expertise? That's really tough. Only in the next five years? <laughs> I have to be realistic. Well, I mean, <laughs> maybe two years, five years. I, you can you can choose the time frame that I think you're most comfortable sort of um, addressing. Wow, I wasn't ready for that one. Um, well, one thing I'll say is that the the um, trend towards more interdisciplinary collaboration and more uh, interprofessional education also, which is, I mm -hmm. think, kind of a rising thing in the health mm -hmm. sector, at least. Uh, I think that's really positive because different disciplines have different skill sets and not everybody has the, the whole picture. So yeah. again, as as an ergonomist with mostly an engineering and very quantitative public health training, it's been really useful for me to learn social science methods. Um, I would say, on the other hand, people who specialize in um, workplace wellness usually don't have any understanding of the ways that a, a job or a workplace can be redesigned to make it safer. Mm. So, yeah. so they are going to end up focusing just on individual behaviors of the individual people that they're coaching or whatever, because they, they take the setting as a given. Whereas I come in and I look at the setting and I'm like, what can we fix here? Yeah. You know, how, how can we yeah. make this better? How can we make this more health promoting and safer for yeah. people? And so that kind of um, br bringing those perspectives together. And bringing those skill sets together and figuring out how to collaborate effectively. Um, my hope is that that's something that um, will will keep developing. I, that's certainly part of the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program goal. Uh, I don't know how widely that's uh, happening in, in other countries. Um, but that's, I, I think there's some trend in that direction, and I absolutely hope that that continues. 
I would agree with you. Um, at least self again, selfishly from a product side, for you know, being involved in a healthcare startup, um, you know, for us, interdisciplinary is not just a buzzword. I mean, it it has tangible benefits. Um, and my experience, at least with product development, has been that uh, to avoid groupthink, it's better to get diverse perspectives uh, looking at the problem, so you can truly understand what the a, what the root cause is, but also a, a, a better um, a, a solution that is better positioned in the marketplace. Uh, that comes from diverse thinking um, because you're basically avoiding groupthink, right? So, yeah. um, and that's another way of avoiding bias as well. So I, yes. I certainly would agree with that. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I just to piggyback on what you're saying, um, the I, I feel like there's a positive trend again, at least within the United States, there's a positive trend towards a greater diversity of voices in in in, in any conversation um, that, you know, I, I was talking earlier about how we, we don't necessarily those of us who are professionals, if you grow up like I did in a household with education that was physically comfortable, I had no idea what the reality was of people mm. in menial labor. I, I really yeah. had absolutely no idea. And and I had little understanding as a white person of what an African-American's experience was or, a, you know, my family there, we were immigrants two generations back or three generations back. I didn't know what it was to arrive in a country and, and try to survive. And so having all of those voices in the conversation is such a positive thing. It's I learned so much from hearing from people whose experiences are so different from mine. You know, as a person, I grow from that, but also as a professional thinking about mm -hmm. what can we do in the workplace, all those people are present and need to be able to talk to each other and understand what each other is going through. So so that's, yeah, that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I very much endorse that. And I, I hope that that's going to keep being, being a trend. I mean, I'm encouraged to see it in our news media that there are reporters of a lot of different backgrounds and, and commentators yeah. with a lot of different backgrounds. And it really broadens my thinking. And I, I think it does for many of us. Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, I just, you touched upon the immigrant experience. Uh, uh, I, I grew up in Australia. My parents were first generation uh, immigrants and I have tremendous, a newfound respect for, for their experience. Uh, you know, as you're growing up, you're, you're, I think you're shielded from a lot of stuff that they went through, but now as adults, um, you know, we have conversations on this and it's just, uh, again, tremendous respect for, um, anecdotally for my parents, but also now as, uh, you know, my partner, uh, uh, her family sometimes from the, uh, from Ukraine will come visit, uh, there, there's just a range. And now, you know, in the Bay Area, of course, it's, it's quite culturally diverse, but um, just having people come in and getting and learning about their experiences is eye-opening. So, um, yeah, I think I think diversity in thought is always going to uh, be useful for individuals and perhaps for us collectively as well. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that totally. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Panet, um Thank you for your time. Uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, look forward to uh, meeting you in person at the conference. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you for your time and obviously for uh, uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us. Uh, this has been uh, incredible. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you. Mm -hmm.